Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Scanning, Storing, and Analyzing Thin Tissue Section Images with Stereo Investigator Whole Slide Edition. My name's Dan Peruzzi, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Nate. Hey, Dan. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today, Nate? Awesome. You? Good. Uh, the, yeah, as you can tell by the title, the idea behind this software Stereo Investigator Whole Slide Edition is for it to not be connected to a camera and a microscope, but instead uh, it works by serving um, whole slide images. Uh, so the idea is that Stereo Investigator Whole Slide Edition is not connected to hardware. Instead, we are going to be doing the analysis on whole slide images. So why whole slide? Why use this process? Uh, one reason is that thin sections, and when I say thin sections, I mean a ballpark around five microns thick are easier to process than thick sections, and by that I mean 30 or 40 micron sections. And uh, that is mostly due to the hist histology process, the sectioning, uh, getting your antibodies or whatever you're st staining with to penetrate. All is done easier with thin sections than thick sections. That's why the emphasis of this program is on uh, whole slide images of thin sections. Uh, the process starts with scanning. Uh, these whole slide images of thin sections can be scanned from scanners such as Bliss or Huron or with the slide scanning module from Stereo Investigator or Neurolucida. Large amounts of these whole slide images from thin sections can be stored using our program BioLucida. And whole slide images are easily loaded into Stereo Investigator Whole Slide Edition for analysis. Today, Nate is going to be talking about how fast we can scan and uh, what large amounts of data we can store. And then I'm going to be giving examples of loading up these whole slide images from BioLucida. And these images are efficient for analysis on a three in a three-dimensional region, it's probably what most of you are interested in, a three-dimensional region that has been sectioned all the way through with thin sections. Uh, this process is also great for two-dimensional substrates such as blood smears or cultures or petri dishes. Cool. I'll turn it over to you, Nate. Thanks, Dan, for that overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, just a quick technical note, in the interface for GoToWebinar, you'll, you should be able to see uh, downloadable handouts, and they contain a lot of the details of anything we gloss over. For instance, the experimental um, examples I'm going to show, uh, they're specified more fully in those handouts. So just And all the references and the formulas it, for what I'm going to exactly. show will be in there also. So you can just grab those anytime that's convenient for you. So really, I want to talk about a little bit about what's, what are some of the aspects of a whole slide imaging experimental workflow? What is important to get it to work? There are, are lots of advantages to these, these scanning devices that have come to be into the market over the past few years. I think one really important one is repeatability. So you can set up a protocol, save it, and scan repeatedly in the same manner um, across slides, across animals, across cohorts, even across different experimental settings. Um, it's something that wasn't always e easy to achieve on open microscope platforms where optics can change or be moved or, or sliders moved around. Um, so it's really, it's, it's good for repeatability, these closed systems. The second thing I think as an advantage is archival. So um, your physical slides are actually turned into, into whole slide images at high resolution. So you don't necessarily need to carry around precious glass that might get broke on subsequent imaging. Um, and I think it's also pretty important um, for fluorescence where the actual source material itself uh, can potentially have uh, a limited lifetime. Um, the one kind of neat thing that most of these systems feature, these workflows feature, is the ability to share slides and manage them and pipe them out to analysis platforms. And ours for that is BioLucida, and it works with almost... All the major manufacturer slide scanners formats that are out there right now. Um, but what that lets you do, though, these server platforms, is they can act as a data hub where you can open up your data to the to the world if it's required for um, you know funding agencies or for even uh, journal articles if there's data sharing requirements. So. Those are some of the, and you're going to see Dan actually access our BioLucida system throughout his you know getting the numbers. Um, the other thing I think 
to really think about are what are the things, so those are the advantages, what are the things that make it, that are important to get one of these workflows to be successful and get to the, get to the point where Dan's going to show you. I think um, scanning capabilities and timing are important. Um, you want to make sure that you've got the right modality, the correct resolution, but that it's efficient. And so I'm going to pop up here a chart and I'll talk about a couple things here. Uh, and this is just various uh, scanning technologies that are out there right now. Uh, two of ours, one is our Vesalius, is a confocal fluorescent scanner, and it scans typically at 10, 20, or 40 uh, X, but it can take other objectives. But it, its its nice feature is it can quickly scan uh, fluorescent and give you confocal quality image. So for instance, you can do a 15 millimeter by 15 millimeter 20 X scan in about two minutes, uh, and that's four channels of fluorescence, so that's pretty fast. Um, the other thing that we're announcing pretty much right now is a, a partnership with Huron Technologies, um, and that's a fast bright field scanner that's for 20 or 40x, um, so basically half micron or quarter micron pixel resolution, and um, its scan time is about a minute for that same 15 millimeter by 15 millimeter area at 20x. So you can imagine with this, with the advent of this efficient scanning, you can now start to think about doing things like series of primate. And so here's an exa a coronal section from a, a primate brain. So you can imagine loading these up and getting your through series uh, for, prime, for things all the way from mouse to primate much more efficiently than we've ever been able to. Um, I, with that, and that's great, but with that comes this, this, this flood of data, this enormous amount of data. And you can imagine, so you, Scanning is good and it's got to be efficient, but the second part of it is being able to curate it, serve it, and actually pipe it to analysis. And I just want to give a couple of examples of that. Um, here's an example of six mice, sectioned, six mouse brains, sectioned sagittally. Um, these were actually uh, sectioned at 60 microns. Someone asked a question about thickness, and the answer there is it depends on what your endpoint is and what you're trying to measure, um, and we can help you with that. But these were sections for their endpoint, which uh, it was neuronal reconstruction, um, but this was a big imaging project. So for, if you image our section at 60 microns sagittally, um, and you're covering, you know, basically forebrain t through the, uh, the cerebellum, you end up with roughly each slide, the image, whole slide image of each slide is going to be about 250,000 by 104,000 pixels. Um, and you're looking at 90 to 96 slides. And so in total, you're probably between seven and seven and a half terabytes for these six animals or 1.2 terabyte per brain imaged at 20x. And again, that's sectioned rather thickly um, and it's six animals. So this would be one cohort and it's mouse. So you can imagine as you move up to primate, you're moving from tens of terabytes for, for, for rodent all the way to probably petabytes uh, for, for through series, you know, for big 3D regions of the brain, I think. Um, so this is specified. I, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Hermina Nedulescu for um, for making this this photo available to us. It's a it's a nice example. And this is again detailed in the in the handouts a little more. So so we've got all this big data, and BioLucid is the way that we pipe it uh, for viewing and analysis into our analysis platforms. Uh, but I want to go over another another example of um, some really a big collection of whole slide images, and that's um, from Dr. Chip Gerfin at the NIMH as his part of the GenZap Cree Brains project. Um, and that is um, hundreds, I think over 200 now, uh, mouse, mouse brains that have inje various uh, tracing injections in them. So each brain is comprised of roughly 100 to 120 serial sections. Um, and what they did was they took and used our technology to get whole slide images and then used our brain maker technology to automatically extract the serial sections and automatically align them into 3D compiled volumes. And then those volumes get put up on a Biolucida server that the world can view. And again, in the handouts, there's a 2013 uh, Neuron paper uh, referenced on this, this project. But what that does is you've got this massive amount of data up there that now people can peruse and at a glance really see you know, where the injection site is and where, where the, the trace goes. Um, so their endpoint for this was visualization. Um, and just some numbers on that, roughly um, for upwards of 200 brains, it's roughly 
about a terabyte right now. And the reason it's, it's only a terabyte for that many brains is because we're using an efficient storage mechanism. We're using a JPEG 2000 compression. Uh, and that does two things. One is it makes the amount of data manageable, but two, it's also web streamable. So it makes it so that these things can be served out to researchers in a reasonable, efficient way. Um, if you don't do that, we would be, we're getting away with about 40 to one compression. So this collection would be 40 terabytes easily. So, you know, having, um, having formats that are, are amenable to streaming and, and efficient storage are important too. And we found for this data set and its signal to noise that 40 to one was where we could go without affecting any visual quality um, by eye. That was determined empirically. Um, so really we're using BioLucida for managing, serving, and viewing and piping to analysis these large volumes of data that arise from whole, whole slide imaging. You've got to have the scanning efficiency and, and modality down, but you also, once you have this flood of data, you have to have a way to curate it, manage it, and, and glue it all together so it can get to the part that Dan's going to talk about next. Um, I would just say you can try try the actual viewer for BioLucida, and um, that GenSat CreeBrains project is up there, ready to be viewed, as well as um, some select um, publications on big imaging projects from uh, Wiley's Journal of Comparative Neurology. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Dan so he can get to the end point of getting some numbers out of these things. Thank you, Nate. And I do notice that question you were talking about. Somebody has asked, can this process be used for 40 micron sections? So you may have 40 micron sections on your glass slide, but don't forget if you scan that in at, say, 20 times, for instance, you're going to end up with maybe a five or six micron optical section. Uh, and, and so that's what we mean by thin sections is that the image itself um, is not an image stack, but is uh, a single, single image plane, whole slide image. Thank you for your questions. Keep those coming. Uh, so this is really exciting to uh, Nate and me uh, who have worked with glass slides our whole careers. Uh, that we could kind of forget about that, forget about the hardware, the camera, and the microscope, and scan in quickly, store copiously, and you're going to see how easy it is for me to get these whole slide images out of BioLucida to show some examples. So I'm going to show examples of unbiased stereology analysis on these whole slide images in the whole slide edition of Stereo Investigator, scanned again from thin around five micron, those can be optical or physical sections. Unbiased stereology gives you estimates of number, length, surface, and volume. We have to use systematic random sampling both between sections and within a section. And we're going to follow rules to avoid over or underestimating. The raw data is going to be the events that you see me marking. For instance, the leading edge of a cell or an intersection with a neurite. Uh, we're going to mark these events. You're going to see me do that right now on whole slide image between the virtual geometrical probe and tissue. For example, in this figure, on the left, it's showing that we can use virtual points shown in red to, est to estimate volume of regions shown in green. As we move to the right, it shows that we can use virtual lines to estimate surface. As we move to the right again, we can see that we can use virtual planes to estimate the length of biological strings, such as blood vessels or axons. And then furthest to the right, that is to estimate number. We need to be in a three-dimensional situation so we can find the leading edge of the particle, which is a cell or a nucleus usually. And that uh, cartoon is showing thin sections uh, we need two uh, sections that are contiguous right next to each other, and we compare the two sections, and we see if the cross-section of the particle is in the green but not the red section. That means we found the leading edge of the particle, and we won't overcount cells. All of this raw data, the events that you count, are put into formulas uh, used to calculate the estimate, and also there'll be a formula that can help you decide whether you've done enough counting or not. So let's start in with these examples. I'm going to start off with examples of probing for data in a three-dimensional region. It's probably what most of you are interested in. This three-dimensional region has been completely sectioned through with thin sections. We can estimate number, length, surface, and volume. 
I'm going to show examples of two probes, the area of fraction fractionator, to estimate percent by volume, and the physical fractionator to estimate number. For area of fraction fractionator, I'm going to show two examples. Uh, one where the strategy was to scan in and load up the whole slide images one at a, uh, only the ones that you're going to sample on. And I'm going to show another example where we have scanned in the whole, all of the whole slide images in the region. So let's start with the area of fraction fractionator. And we are in the whole slide edition, which can estimate number, length, surface, and in this case, we're going to estimate volume. We're going to use the area of fraction fractionator probe. This is a three-dimensional situa uh, situation, a three-dimensional region that I'm going to probe. It's the brain, and we're going to look at plaque load, percent of plaque by volume. Since it's a three-dimensional situation, we have to tell it how many sections we have, how many we're skipping. We're going to use an interval of every ninth section and count 10 sections. That means we have 90 total. As I said, these are thin sections. They shrunk down to seven microns in thickness. For unbiased stereology, we always pick a random starting point. Now I'm going to go to BioLucida and load up section seven. So we have a direct link to BioLucida, and it's very easy to just load up these whole site images that have been scanned and stored. And this is the first section. Uh, of the brain region, the plaque is in red. Imagine how hard it would be to trace every one of those little circles of plaque. Um, we're going to use our auto move area at the white dotted line, and we need to trace the region of interest for the first section. And when, when we're done with this section, we would go and do the other nine sections. I'm going to show you just an example on this section. And this strategy is to only scan in the sections that are going to be sampled. And so I've, I speeded up the tracing, and we have traced that section. And now we go to probes, and we have to preview uh, the systematic random sampling. And I'm going to show three examples of a random throw. That means you will not be able to control where your counting frames go down. The counting frames are where we're going to mark the plaque. And that ensures that we're doing things in an unbiased way. That's right. You can't go to uh, regions that subconsciously you want to go right. to. We need to define the counting frame itself. That's where the points are going to show up. I have previously decided on 150 microns in the x-axis and 80 microns in the y-axis. And we are going to put points where we see plaque. The plaque is in red. You can see it's kind of diffuse there. Point counting really lends itself to counting, uh, uh, getting volumes of diffuse regions. Here's our macro view. In white, we can see where we are in the lower power image. And now that we have set up the requirements of the probe, we can open it. It's called area fraction fractionator to estimate the percent of one phase of tissue. Uh, we've already set this, the counting frame dimensions. Now I need to decide how far apart are the points going to be that are in the counting frame. I think a distance of about that will be good. Let's just change it to kind of a round number. The points will be spaced by 15. And I've checked this box, which is going to automatically mark every point with a triangle, which indicates no plaque. Our job is going to be to put a yellow asterisk down where we see that Really, it's not no plaque, and there is plaque there. This makes it very efficient because it's mostly no plaque. So when I start the probe, it's automatically going to put magenta triangles on every point. This, uh, this, and the macro view shows our systematic random location. And on the big main view, we can see there's a magenta triangle over every point. The point is the vertex of the of the white plus sign, and but right here, really. This point is on red, so I change it to a yellow asterisk to indicate there is plaque there. We go to the next scan site. You can see where that is in the macro view. This, in my judgment, has no points over the plaque. Here we have some places where there's a triangle over plaque. We need to change that to a yellow asterisk to indicate that there is plaque there. This 
program is going to take all the yellow asterisks and divide them by asterisks plus triangles. That's going to give us a ratio of volume to volume. Uh, we're going to be able to estimate the plaque load. And you can see how quickly this goes, especially when one phase is predominant over the other. Automatically paint in all of the no plaque markers, and we simply need to go in there and see if any of the points, which again is the vertex of the white uh, plus sign, is over the plaque. And I actually may be using too many sites here. You may be able to get away with less and still get a good snapshot of what's going on. That's called uh, considering your precision. We can help you with those decisions too. Today I'm mostly concentrating on the rules to follow to avoid bias. And this is a really fast and easy probe. You see how fast we did one section. Couple that with being able to serve the uh, whole slide images directly and not to have to worry about any hardware or slides. And we have a really efficient process here. Uh, the estimate is that for plaque, it is 1.6% plaque. That's a volume to volume ratio and subtract that from 100 and we get 98.4%. You would probably need to go ahead and do about maybe nine other sections and you would end up with a very good estimate of plaque load. So you could easily get through an animal within an hour. And if you're not, uh, there's probably something slowing you down that shouldn't be, so give us a call and we can help you out with that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to show another example of area fraction fractionator. In this case, all of the sections were scanned on one whole, side, whole slide image. Again, we're in the whole slide edition of Stereo Investigator. We can estimate volume. We're going to use the area fraction fractionator. This time, I'm not going to start out with the serial section manager because we have all of the sections on one whole slide image and we are going to actually be able to automatically trace all those sections to make this whole process even more efficient. So here we are in BioLucida where the whole slide has been scanned. I have picked a random start point of three, the third section. I'm going to look at every fifth section. I predetermined the random start point of the third section. I'm going to look at every fifth section. We don't have to trace these all by hand. We have some filters here and sensitivity. I'm, uh, for outline detected objects, I'm going to show the color and then just click outline objects and way faster than a human could do this, all of those regions are traced. I didn't bother tracing just the five sections I'm going to use because the process is so fast. Uh, let's zoom in and zoom out and we can see that it actually has done a good job tracing. I am going to estimate the percent by volume of white matter. I'm only going to use the obvious commissures here so that I can give uh, uh, an easy example. Counting frame is 350 by 350. Next we need to set the systematic random sampling, which means how often does the counting frame appear. And again, this is a random throw that you will not be able to control when you do the counting. Not only does every section have an equal chance of being used for sampling, but once you're on a section, every point on that section is equally likely to be sampled, and that's one way we stay away from bias. Okay, the area fraction fractionator probe is ready. We do want to use the serial section manager. There's a very nice feature of this. We just click this box here, and it will take, it will recognize all of those tracings, put them all into the serial section manager. The evaluation interval is one and these are thin sections, and you always pick a random starting section to avoid bias. Okay, so now I think we are ready to open the probe, area fraction fractionator. We set the size of the counting frame. We set the spacing among the counting frames. These are the five sections I'm going to do. And again, at each site, we're going to automatically fill in a magenta triangle. This time it means gray matter. And our job will be to change any magenta triangles to yellow asterisks, which indicates white matter. And I am going to be very rudimentary in my choice of white matter. I'm just going to use these obvious commissures here. OK, so here we are at the first random systematic location. I'm using my mouse wheel to make a, a paintbrush at the size I want. And now it's just very easy to change from a triangle to an asterisk where I see that it's actually over white matter. 
not gray matter. If you make a mistake, uh, you can use your middle button, or I'll just show you that I'm picking gray matter here, and it's easy to change back to the actual marker that's supposed to be there. Next scan site, you're moved to the next systematic random location, and it's quite easy to paint these markers. There's also a shortcut that you can use your F2 key. Uh, so you don't have to click twice to get to the next scan site. And in my judgment, I'm not going to put any white matter uh, marked here. Of course, you'd be using your own judgment, your own regions, and your own uh, different types of tissues. Uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to show you how the next one is picked. So I just did the third section. Now I'm doing the eighth section. Everything stays the same. And I'll just show you two examples here. Same thing. This just shows how easy this is. Uh, you should be able to get through uh, one animal, like, like Nate mentioned before, in, a, in about an hour. I'm going to skip ahead to the last section. Just uh, to save time. Uh, same type of thing. We are putting points over one phase of the tissue, in this case white matter, and another type of marker over the other type of tissue. In this case, it'll take the number of yellow asterisks and divide it by the number of asterisks plus triangles. And that's quite efficient because all the sections are there. It's a very quick probe to do, and you can get data rapidly, efficiently, without bias. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we've done, the third, the eighth, etc. We've done every fifth section. The, uh, so the formula will actually uh, extrapolate for the fifth five sections that we've skipped. There's a section interval, and this shows that for white matter, the estimate is 14%. And that makes sense on a gut level. We marked a, a lot less white matter commissures than we did gray matter. The gray matter is 86%. We're also seeing a CE down at the bottom. And the CE for the gray matter is below 0.1. The CE for the white matter is above 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is the traditional breaking point. Um, so what this is telling us is that for gray matter, we have done enough sampling. But for white matter, we need to get in there and take more, uh, use more sections. And that makes sense because the variance of the yellow asterisk is more than the variance of the magenta triangles. And that's what the coefficient of error is an indicator of. Right? It does. It okay. gauges the number of points from section to section. If there's little variance, it goes low. Uh, in other words, the, the cross sections are more similar from section to section for the gray matter than for the white matter. Got it. So those are examples of, uh, pro, uh, of estimating percent by volume. Let's take a look at the physical fractionator, which is going to estimate number of cells. We're going to use two contiguous thin sections. We're in Stereo Investigator Whole Side Edition. We can estimate volume, surface, length. In this case, we're going to estimate number. We're going to use a probe called the physical fractionator workflow to estimate cell number on adjacent thin tissue pairs. These tissue pairs are taken every 750 microns, and they are 5 microns thick. And again, they've been scanned in using a scanner like, like Bliss or Huron. This shows that two uh, pairs of sections being stored. I'm only going to show this on one pair of sections. So we go to number, we go to physical fractionator, we start a new subject. We have a workflow for this with steps 1 through 11. For each step, it tells you what to do below so you don't have to be searching through the menus. These pairs of sections are 3 quarters of a millimeter apart, and they're 5 microns thick. We're going to compare the reference to the lookup, and if we see the cross-section of the cell nuclei and the reference, but not the lookup, it means that we have found the leading edge of the cell nucleus. So that's the reference image. This is cardiac tissue. I'm going to be estimating the number of 
cardiac muscle fiber nuclei. These are round nuclei that we see in the middle of the cross section through the muscle fiber. We're going to be looking at the round nuclei, not at the flat fibroblast nuclei. Okay, so the next step is to go to low mag. This uh, workflow really does uh, walk you through everything, makes it easier to come back to and easy to teach. Next step is to trace the region of interest and in uh, to save time, I just will speed this up so you don't want, have to watch me trace the whole thing. So we're tracing the first section, the first five micron section, and that's called the reference section. So we go to high mag, and notice on the right we can see round nuclei that are in the middle of the cross section of the cardiac fibers, and we see flat nuclei. We're going to be estimating the number of round nuclei. They're easy to spot. They're right in the middle of that pink cross section. Uh, the counting frame, uh, we uh, set that up to a good size, and now we're setting up the systematic random sampling, the spacing among the counting frames. You can save the parameters for the next animal. And now what we're doing is taking smaller pictures off of the whole slide images. So we are taking nine small images, just the size of the field, uh, that are systematically randomly selected, and then the program is going to put those small images on the, on the second whole slide image. We're going to be able to slide the opacity of those images, flip between them, and decide whether we can see the cross-section of the round nucleus in the first but not in the second image. If that's the case, we found the leading edge of the cell, and we can count the cell. And that makes sure you don't overcount. Nucleus, yes, because every nucleus has only one leading edge. So instead of doing this at low power, counting nucleus pieces, uh, we're doing it at a higher power, and we are count we're finding the leading edge of the nucleus. It would be impossible to find the leading edge of the cell because these cardiac fiber cells branch a lot. Branching, yeah. Yep. Okay. So we have lined up our image from the first section with the image of the second section. I have pre uh, line these images up with each other automatically in our program called BrainMaker. So now, at high power, I need to concentrate here. That's where I'm going to look for the round nuclei. And I have one image superimposed on another. If you've ever done this before, you move the one image, and then it just kind of, you know when it's lined up because everything lines up. It gets nice and clear. It does. Let me show you again. We need to concentrate there in the counting frame. And you can see that I have one 5 micron image that I can see through over another one. I line them up. Now, I want to concentrate. Uh, there's the reference. I want to concentrate on these three nuclei, one, two, three. Here's the reference. I'm going to hit a key on my keyboard and switch to the next section. And we can see two of those nuclei have disappeared. So we put X's over those because we found the, their tops. We found their leading edges. Let's look at this one. Reference, I hit a key on the keyboard, look up. It disappears. That means we found its top. This is the physical fractionator method in the dissector. Let's check that one there again. Uh, and this one here, we can see the cross section in both five micron contiguous sections, so we don't count that one. We don't count this one that goes through the red line either. Let's see one more example of this. We have the reference five micron image superimposed on the next section, which is called the lookup. And it's that was easy to line up. I'm going to make it so we're completely looking at the reference, completely looking at the next section, and that looks lined up to me. So I'm sliding the opacity with this slider. Now I'm going to begin placing markers. I'm going to use a key on my keyboard to switch between the reference and the lookup image. Let's con concentrate on that one, that nucleus, not that one, but yes, that one. And Right away, the one in the upper right corner, I can see its cross-section of the nucleus is present in the reference, but not in the next section, the lookup. We found its top, we count it. Look at this flat one here. It moved a little, uh, but it's still there. Okay, now the one in the lower left corner is here today and gone tomorrow. It's in the reference, but not in the lookup image. Uh, we have a couple other... Uh, uh, what I mean to say is I'm done with the examples uh, for the physical fractionator. And now, just like for, uh, uh, we're prompted to save it after every uh, section, which I like. 
Now we're going to view the results and we're going to go to what we call the probe run list. And we are do we, we just did unidirectional counting. We did not turn around when we got to the bottom and count in the other direction. So we take this 570,988 estimate, but we would never do that because the uh, yet because the CEs are high and we have only counted 13 cells. You really want to count 100 or 150, then look at your CEs. There's other ways to deal with the precision, meaning have I done enough counting? And we can help you with that. Okay, so we just saw examples of uh, probe in the three-dimensional region that's been sectioned through with thin sections, area fraction fractionator for percent by volume, physical fractionator for number of cells. Let's switch to a two-dimensional situation. For example, bottom of a petri dish, culture, or a blood smear. And this uh, strategy of uh, of scanning and storing and then serving to the software works really great for the examples I just showed. It also really lends itself to two-dimensional situations. Uh, we can estimate number, length, and area. I'm going to show the fractionator probe, which is just like the physical fractionator, but there's no Z direction to worry about. I'm going to estimate the number of white blood cells in a bone marrow smear. By the way, I'm showing the um, references in italics right below it. Uh, but all the references and formulas are available to you in the electronic handout. I'm also going to show an example of the Petrometrics probe to estimate length, in this case, of neurites in a culture. So let's take a look at those. We'll start with the Fractionator probe. Whole slide edition of Stereo Investigator, number. Fractionator probe to estimate cell number in a mono layer like a petri dish. In this case, it's going to be a bone marrow smear. We won't have to worry about the serial section manager because we're going to treat the smear as um, it, it's um, a two D entity. It's a two D image, and it's it it's its whole world is just a smear. Right. There's no other sections to worry about. Right. Uh, it's an incomplete smear, but this is the example I have, so I'm going to use this. And of course, you would have your own slides, and you would define your own regions. That was easy to trace. Here is the actual size. I'm going to do my best to mark white blood cells and white blood cell precursors. Stay away from the red blood cells that have their nuclei in them still. I am tracing uh, using a counting frame of 90 by 90. That's where we're going to mark the white blood cells. We're not worried about any Z direction here. The um, systematic random sampling, this I'll show you some examples. Again, you won't be able to control uh, where those counting frames go. And I'll show about half of these sites to give a good example. Okay, the macro view shows us where we are. We're going to turn on the fractionator probe. And do we want to use the serial section manager? We only use that for 3D situations, so the answer is no. This is a 2D situation. We don't have to worry about managing sections. Uh, we've already set up the counting frame and the spacing among the counting frames. It tells me to select a marker. I have one over there called white blood cells. That's our first systematic random location in the macro view. And here is a white blood cell that goes through the green line and not the red line. I count it. Now I go to the next scan site. And this is kind of fun. We just mark the white blood cells that we see. I'll stay away from those platelets. And I'll stay away from that because it goes through a red line. You go to the next scan site. You can see where those are on the macro view. And if you make a mistake, and I think that maybe that is a red blood cell, it's easy to erase. So I'm just going to mark these four white but blood it's cells also that I an, see. an image that's online, so you could have someone else take a look at that too. That's a great point to uh, collaborate and compare, get on the same page about what you're marking. And also, um, a good point is that these images are not coming from your local hard drive, right? right. Yep. Okay. Okay, so I just did about half the sites there uh, since this is a demonstration. And we'll go to the probe run list again. That's where we see the estimates. 
and it's we've counted 19 markers. It's estimating there is 7,179 white blood cells in that whole region that I define, but the CEs are high. That's telling you you need to get back in there and uh, do some more counting frames. Yep. Then when it sees uh, that the variance is at an acceptable level, the CE will go lower. Right. Okay, let's take a look at the other example we have for you in a two-dimensional substrate. In this case, we are looking at a culture of neurites, and we're going to estimate the length of the neurites. And again, we can estimate number, surface, or volume, but in this case, we're going to estimate length. And the probe is called Petrometrics because it can be used in a Petri dish. In this case, we're going to use it on a 2D culture. It could uh, also be used in a smear, although that, that's probably more you would be estimating numbers in a smear. Okay, so again, we're going to BioLucida. This was scanned in, was stored in BioLucida. It's a very simple image of a culture, fluorescent uh, imaging. So the first thing to do is to trace the region of interest. Again, we don't need to worry about different sections because this is a 2D situation. It's a culture. You can imagine how long it would take to trace all of these dendrites, all of these neurites. Instead of doing that, we're going to use unbiased stereology. The probe is going to be a line, and we're going to mark where the line intersects the neurite. So let's look at its actual size, and I'm going to zoom in. It's okay to zoom past the actual size if you can do a better job with the probe, as long as things don't get too pixelated. I'm actually going to zoom in a little more if I can get away with it. And as long as I can see the neurite, and I'm going to be able to tell whether a line goes through there that the program generates, so I'm going to use this zoom level. We're going to turn on the Petrometrics probe, and that's good that we're not using the Serial Section Manager. And this is um, the parameters that we've already set up. And here, our job is to where we see a green line going through a neurite to put a marker on it. Nothing happening there. Click F2 or go to the next scan site. And that's one of the tenets of unbiased stereology is to make the event that you mark very obvious. We saw examples of marking the tops of cells or finding the top of cells, um, marking points for volume. Here we're marking intersections for length, and it's very easy um, to see where these intersections are. And these intersections will be put in a formula to estimate the length of the total length of neurites in the culture. And we can take a look at that now. And it is showing that we did 11 intersections and estimating there's the raw data. We'll go back to the estimate 7,220 microns. And we probably want more intersections than that. But uh, with just a few clicks, you've, you've analyzed your entire dish. And without yes. having to use thresholding for automated methods or anything like that. That's right. And I've done that in an unbiased way. Now, it may be that the precision is not high enough and that we need more intersections to actually get a good snapshot of what's going on there. But you saw how quick it is to mark those intersections. Okay, at this point, let's see what questions have come in. Okay. That looks like uh, our moderator has us pretty well caught up. Yeah, it looks like the moderator has been answering every question. And any we don't catch, we'll, we'll send out after the webinar as well, so don't worry. We're going to answer those written with full answers, and everybody will be able to see the uh, questions and the answers. Yep. All right, let's keep going with the examples. Uh, we saw examples both in a 3D and a 2D situation of estimating number and estimating volume. In those cases, the interaction between the probe and the tissue, uh, the isotropy of the interaction is built in. Now I'm going to look at some uh, examples of estimating surface and estimating thickness. We're going to look at the Weibel probe, which is actually not a fractionator probe. It's an NVV ref probe. We're going to be marking intersections for the 
uh, surface of the alveolar wall in the lung, and we're going to be marking points for the volume of the lung. So we're going to get an estimate of surface per volume, alveolar wall surface per volume of lung. That's micron squared per micron cubed. I'm also going to show an example of orthogonal intercepts, which is a probe to estimate the thickness, which is a kind of length. And I'm going to show an example using my best judgment, uh, showing the thickness of the maternal fetal interface in the placenta. Let's take a look at those two examples. We'll start with the Weibel probe. Okay, this is under surface, and the probe is called Weibel. We're going to estimate the surface area of the alveolar walls per volume section of lung. We're going to use lines and points. And we need to set up the serial section manager because the lung is a three-dimensional organ. We have section completely through the uh, region of the lung. We want to study 100 thin sections. Interval of 10, these are thin sections that have shrunk down to 7. I always pick a random starting point. Okay, so I'm going to go to BioLucida and pick section 2, which was randomly picked. Open up the BioLucida server and open our whole slide image. Okay, so here we are at low power. We set up the serial section manager already to show the intervals. We have the auto move on and we're going to trace the region on the whole slide image of the first section. After we did this, I'm going to show you an example on the first section, we, uh, you would go ahead and do the other nine sections or so. Okay, so we'll speed this up so that the whole thing is traced and we'll do image zoom to fit. And now let's go to the workspace. Actually, what I want to do first is show this at its actual size. Okay, so you can appreciate the alveoli there. We can see about three or four capillaries. I am going to estimate the surface of the alveolar walls per volume of lung. The probe is called the Weibel probe. And the length of the lines I'm going to use to probe with, line segments, are 150 microns. So we can see blue lines. That's going to probe for the intersection. And the macro view, that shows where we are. But I want to get to a predetermined, systematic, random location. And you, so you can see me going through the macro view. Yeah, you can't just pick the region you want to go to. It has to be predetermined systematically and randomly. Okay, so we have the lines to mark the intersections on the walls of the alveoli and the points to mark the volume of the lung. Our job is to wherever there is a point over lung, we mark it. So actually all of the points in this field of view are over lung, so I can use a marquee with my control key and quickly mark all of those points. That's for the volume. And then every place I see the line going through the wall of the alveoli, I mark it. And I'm interested in the surface on both sides of the wall, so I uh, mark both sides of the alveolar wall. These intersections for surface and points for volume will be used in a formula to estimate surface per volume. And there you can see I've just sped it up and marked a lot of intersections. Now let's go to the next systematic random location. As you can see on the macro view, move the same number of, of uh, fields of view. So this is, that's a systematic part. The random part was the random start. And again, if a point is over the lung, it gets marked. I'll show you one more example of that. If an intersection if a line goes through the alveolar wall, we mark it. Let me actually zoom in on this. So uh, I want to make sure you can see it as well as I can. And notice that I put two triangles down because the line went through that wall twice. You don't have to mark them in exactly the right place. It's using the number of intersections and the number of points. So I'm going to stop the probe here. You would go to about 10 fields and do about 10 sections. 
and then see if that was enough by looking at your CEs or some other method. I'm going to view the results though. It is the raw data, 28 points, 95 intersections. It's put into a formula to get 0 0.09 square microns of alveolar wall per cubic microns of lung. I haven't been showing you these formulas, but I'll show you this one. I want to show you how easy it is to uh, open the formula part of the program. And now you'll actually see what's being done with these intersections and points that you mark. Surface per volume equals twice the number of intersections. It makes sense intersections would be in the numerator. And it's L over 2. L is the length of lines times the number of points. We use L over 2 because we have two points per line. So that's a uh, quick way to uh, get a surface per volume estimate. Dan, I think we have a couple of questions here. Oh, uh, good. One looks like, um, is petrometrics the equivalent to space balls for thin samples? Yes, it is. Excellent. Good question. Uh, you would not be doing space balls uh, with this incarnation of our program. It's whole slide for thin sections. Space balls needs thick sections. But that is a good insight. Petrometrics is the 2D version for estimating length of space balls. And a similar question, is fractionator the equivalent of optical fractionator for thin sections? Uh, yes, and it's also, well, uh, let me see, no. Um, optical fractionator is used on thick sections, image stacks or thick sections, about 40 microns thick. Physical fractionator is used on two contiguous uh, thin sections, so that's still a three-dimensional situation but you are um, probing up and down uh, kind of in a digital rather than in an analog way. You're using these thin sections to look at, as, as I showed an example of, uh, rather than focusing up and down through the thick section, which I mentioned the thick sections are harder to get histologically than the thin sections. And then the third one is the fractionator, and that's for a 2D region. That's where you really have a 2D entity that you're trying to quantify. That's right. So optical and physical are both for 3D two different methods. The one that's relevant for um, whole slide is physical fractionator. We'll write that up and make it available too. Uh, thanks for pointing out those questions. Yeah. Okay, I believe we did Weibull, but we need to do orthogonal intercepts. Let's take a look at that. In this case, I'm going to be looking at the placenta of pregnancy and estimating the width of the maternal fetal uh, membrane where the diffusion from maternal blood to fetal blood and back has to happen. I'm actually going to be um, using line segments to, to estimate the width. And this is a 3D uh, situation, so of course I need to set up the serial section manager. We have 80 sections total and these have shrunk down to six microns. Again, we don't want to be biased, so we pick a random starting point. I'm now going to go to BioLucida and open section eight. Placenta, 12 weeks along pregnancy. And we can see cross sections through the villi uh, from the fetus with the capillaries in them and all the white space between the cross sections of the villi is the maternal blood space. And as usual, our first task is to trace the region where we want to estimate the thickness of the maternal fetal uh, diffusion membrane. And we'll speed that up. And you make the decisions about where your region is. Let's look at the actual size. by going to actual size. And let's get away from this uh, region where we don't see a lot of cross sections of villi. And now I want to zoom in uh, to the level at which I'm going to mark the width from the maternal blood space to a capillary in the cross section of the villi. I think this, we can see a nice transverse section of a capillary there in the cross section through the villi. We can see the maternal blood space. We're going to use, define the counting frame as 125 by 125. Let me move it a little so you can see. 125 by 125. We're going to put it right in the center so there's no edge effects. OK. 
counting frame has been defined. Now we're going to do a systematic random sampling. And again, I'm going to show examples that these are all random throws. You are not going to be able to control where that counting frame goes down. That's one of the ways we stay unbiased. We can see in the macro view, it's uh, hard to see, but I'll circle it. That's where we are now. So I'm going to start the probe so it sets up the systematic random sampling on the section level. Orthogonal intercepts, we've already set up the, the parameters on the top of this dialog box. I want my grid to be 50. We're going to see a green grid inside our counting frame. Our job is every place where the green line goes through the border between the cross-section of the villi and a capillary and the maternal blood space here, we mark it. So that's an unbiased way to pick where we make our measurements from. Notice this line I'm pulling out is shaped like a T. So that top of the T is going to help me draw a line from the border to the first capillary I see, which I think is there. And that helps me draw an orthogonal line to the capillary. So here again is a place where the green line uh, hits the border between the maternal blood space and I see a capillary there transverse. So that's how long my judgment says the width is from the red blood cells in the maternal blood space to the capillaries uh, in the uh, cross sections of the fetal villi. Okay, here we can see we have a cross section which is uh, transverse, so the thickness of the wall is thicker than it really should be, but I still mark that thickness, and now I've shown that I've marked a bunch of these thicknesses from the maternal blood space to the capillaries in the villi of the fetus. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the probe run list and view the results. The general results show the estimate, but here's the raw data. So those are those th list of thicknesses. You can do whatever you want with those. You can report the mean, uh, but right here I'm showing uh, an estimate where a formula was used to make up for the fact that we have some transverse sections through the thickness of this membrane, and we would be overestimating. You can see the um, reference and the formula and decide whether you what uh, result you want to use. And a lot of this is also at stereology.info too, right? That's right, and the handout and our has, a, has a link to stereology.info awesome. for every probe. Great. Uh, let's see where we are here. Um, okay. Nope. I think we've, we're caught up on most things here. Okay, good. I must be being clear. Either that or everyone is completely confused. <laughs> Just um, one thing, I'll, I'll jump in. We're getting close to the hour, and we've got a couple, couple more, um, a couple more uh, examples to go through. Just two more. They're about particles <clears throat> and estimating volume. So that's we'll probably go five minutes over or, or so. So, um, and if you have to go, that's it's no problem. Just um, be aware. We'll make uh, this will be available online later. So if you if you miss anything, don't worry. You can always catch the end of it later. I just wanted to throw that out Thank there. you, Nate. If you want to see the point sample intercepts to estimate the volume uh, in a volume-weighted manner, or you want to see surface-weighted star volume to estimate the star volume in a surface-weighted manner, and you have to leave now, that will be available later. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am going to show these examples, and the first one, point sample intercepts, it is sampled in a way that the larger cells will be uh, caught for um, probing more often than the smaller cells. And that'll be obvious when you see the probe. I'm going to estimate the volume of the larger nuclei in the melanoma in the dermis. And then I'm going to look at surface weighted star volume and estimate uh, this type of sampling favors spaces that have bigger surfaces. So I'm going to be estimating the volume of the trabecular components in spongy bones but only what can be seen from a certain point on the surface. That's why it's called star volume. It's called surface weighted because the bigger spaces are more likely to be sampled, and it's called star volume because we estimate the volume only from a point that can be appreciated on the surface. Okay, let's take a look, and you'll see exactly what I mean by that. Here's point sampled intercepts.
point sampled intercepts is under the volume region. And we're going to do the sampling in such a way that larger nuclei are more likely to be sampled than smaller nuclei. It's still unbiased, but we do know that it's volume weighted. And this is a three-dimensional region. We need to set up the serial section, 100 sections total, skipping every tenth. They've shrunk down to 5 microns, and again, we stay unbiased by picking a random starting point. Let's go to BioLucida and get section 4. A slide of skin with melanoma. We can see all the blue in the dermis there from the hypertrophy nuclei. Uh, we're going to use our automotive region and trace the dermis. And it will be up to you how you want to trace your region. And once again, I'm going to speed this up in the interest of time. OK, so we have the first whole slide image region traced. And of course, you'd be doing probably about nine others after this. Let's go to the actual size. Turn on the macro view. That shows where we are in the bird's eye view. And now let's go to the point sampled intercept probe. It's going to put down lines that are spaced at 35 microns. So you can see these red lines, and they have dash marks in them. Every place a dash mark goes through a nuclei, I will estimate its volume. So here is one place where the dash goes right through the nucleus. And I've made these markers a little bigger so you can see them. I click on one side of the nucleus, right where the line goes through the nuclear membrane, and on the other side. Now I scan through all of these marks, looking for where one of these dashes goes through a nucleus. Here is another place where that happens. So I click on the little mark, the vertex, and then I show it. What I'm doing is defining, defining a random chord through the nucleus. That data is going to be used to get a volume estimate. Bigger nuclei are more likely to be caught than smaller nuclei, so it's a volume-weighted estimate. Let me zoom in on this, just in case you can't see it as well as I can right in front of the screen. The tick mark goes through the hypertrophy nucleus. So it gets picked, and now our job is to show where the line goes through the membrane of the nucleus. And that data is used to get an estimate, a volume-weighted estimate. Uh, people who study melanoma are more interested in the larger nuclei anyway, so it makes sense to get a volume-weighted estimate. We turn off the probe, go to the probe run list, look at the results. And we can see the mean volume. We can also see volumes for each nuclei that was estimated. Cool. Much quicker than trying to um, focus through the nucleus and trace it at every level. Right, right. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at our last example, surface-weighted star volume. This is the Stereo Investigator whole slide edition. We're going to go to surface-weighted star volume to estimate complex, non-convex volumes in isotropic sections. In this case, I'm going to estimate the volume of trabecular compartments in spongy bone. It's surface weighted because compartments w that are larger, that have larger surfaces, are more likely to be sampled. We have 110 thin sections in total. We're skipping every 11th section. Six microns thick, random start, section six. Let's go to BioLucida and open Section 6. And we'll open one thin section. You're going to be doing nine others after this. We can see the compact bone on the edges and the spongy bone in the middle, the trabecular arrangement. Uh, and we can see cross sections through the red bone and the compartments. I've already set up Serial Section Manager, so now it's time to trace the region. Let's go ahead and look at the actual size. And we can see the red bone, that's the walls of the compartment. It has little osteocytes in it. 
and we can also see the compartments which are filled with blood cells. Where, uh, the macro view shows us where we are. We can go to the probes, turn on surface weighted star volume. It's going to put down a special line that's 25 microns long. And every place that line intersects the bone walls, that's where I start my observation of the volume. We're going to get to the first systematic random location. Again, you can't pick where you want to uh, probe. That has to be set up ahead of time to avoid bias. Okay, so we have blue lines, and every place a blue line goes through the wall, which is are these red spicules of bone. So if we look at this, we see red spicules of bone. Those are the walls, and th these are the compartments. And every place a blue line goes through the wall of the compartment, that's an unbiased way to choose where we're going to observe the volume. Notice that these lines do not go around corners, so we can only observe the volume from that particular point on the surface. That's why it's called a star volume. It's called surface weighted because we're more likely to sample larger compartments with larger surface areas. So I'll show you a few examples of this. It shoots on a line. I find the far wall and mark it. And now I've just um, done a whole bunch of them. Let me just give you more of the flavor of this probe by going to the next systematic random location and show a couple more examples. Then we'll look at the estimate and the formula. Estimating surface weighted star volume of the trabecular spaces and spongy bone. So there is this point on the surface, and here's another point on the surface. The line goes all the way across. I click it where I find the next wall, and this is a star volume. Okay, so let's just speed this up. Here's a whole bunch of them that were probed. These lengths are going to be used to estimate the mean volume, surface weighted, the mean star volume of these uh, holes that are considered to be in the trabeculae of spongy bone. So we're going to end the probe and the results are shown there. The star volume is 7.8 million cubic microns. Uh, it's easy to look up the formula. I will show you this formula. Let's look at surface weighted star volume and the raw data that went into there is the L bar and the estimate is two-thirds pi L bar cubed, uh, mean, the, the mean length of those uh, uh, line segments that we generated is the raw data. So you're really able to uncover uh, an aspect of the tissue with some simple operations, a relatively complex aspect of the tissue. With yeah, we clicking. can think of how uh, we might have done that by tracing. We would have had to have s many cross sections right. through one space and trace it all. And this is just much more efficient. Right. And when you add together the scanning and the storing, uh, and then how easy the slides are, I hope we showed that you can get efficient and unbiased estimates very quickly using uh, this Stereo Investigator whole slide edition. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. It's been really fun. Um, and you can see all of this stuff, including the scanners we talked about earlier uh, at the uh, Society for Neuroscience meeting this year in San Diego. We'll be there in the exhibit hall from the 3rd to the 7th, and our booth number is 2235. We'd love to see you, so stop by if, if you'd like. Anything else, Dan? Thank you very much for your attention. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone.